be discussing about uh, a very common and uh, fairly uh, important uh, topic from the undergraduate point of view and as well as a postgraduate point of view that is atopic dermatitis it's one of the commonest cases i see in the uh, opd as a dermatologist and all of us should be able to recognize what are the signs and symptoms and what is the basic management of atopic dermatitis okay so atopic dermatitis it uh, it has to be remembered as the itch that rashes so um, most of you know most of the conditions in dermatology that we know is the rash that itches that is there are only a few uh, rashes which cause itching but atopic dermatitis is a, a primarily itchy condition that rashes so this is the line that you need to remember atopic dermatitis it's an itch that rashes so it can be defined as a chronic inflammatory skin condition which typically begins during infancy or early childhood and it's often associated with other allergic uh, conditions uh, such as asthma allergic uh, rhinitis allergic conjunctivitis food allergies and other conditions so this is known as the atopic march which i'll be discussing about further so this is the basic pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis there are a, there are a lot of factors which come into play there is no single uh, etiology which causes atopic dermatitis it's Uh, like a lot of hypotheses and a combination of these hypotheses which causes atopic dermatitis the important ones are genetics uh, environmental factors skin barrier dysfunction and immunological factors so these are the four main contributing factors to the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis so coming to the genes there are various genes more than 100 genes which predispose to atopic dermatitis what we need to remember here is that uh it's important to ask for a family history of atopic dermatitis in any child who presents with um, atopic dermatitis a family history of atopy and we also need to ask for a family history of other allergic conditions like asthma and uh, allergic rhinitis allergic conjunctivitis and all these things so remember that it's positive in around 40 to 70% of the patients and the incidence is higher in monozygotic twins I'll not be going into very much uh, like a detailed explanation of the genes which are involved. It's it's uh, pretty complicated. Just remember that there are certain genes also which predispose to atopic dermatitis. So this is the important uh, slide here: the environmental factors which lead to atopic dermatitis. So there are a lot of factors. Uh, the important ones are pollution, uh, microbes. food allergens inhaled allergens and seasonal influence i'll tell you about a little bit of each of these factors so pollution uh, so there are a lot of randomized control trials which are conducted and all these trials say that kids who are living in the cities are much much more predisposed to atopic dermatitis than kids who are living in uh, rural areas or tier 2 or tier 3 cities so uh, from these trials they concluded that pollution has a major role in the causation of atopic dermatitis yeah like i said there's a higher eczema burden in cities compared to the countryside yeah and and diet how does diet influence atopic dermatitis so like it's a very common uh, misconception that most of the dermatological conditions are aggravated by some sort of food or um, some sort of dietary restrictions has to be made that is the one question which every patient asks to dermatologist no matter what the skin condition is what should i not eat what can i eat can i eat this substance can i eat this can i eat non veg can i eat egg uh i get itching when i eat chicken so this is the most common question or most common thing which the patients tell us uh but what is to be remembered is there are a very few dermatological conditions which are directly influenced by diet there's actually only one condition in dermatology that uh we ask the patients to avoid certain diet that is dermatitis herpetiformis because that is induced by um, gluten containing foods so we ask the patient to take a gluten free diet so that is actually the only condition in dermatology where we avoid tell the patients to avoid certain food groups so all the other conditions have no direct relation to any sort of diet uh, but many conditions like atopic dermatitis acne psoriasis and all of these uh, are aggravated they are not directly induced they are aggravated by Uh, a high carb and a high fat diet so like the slide says the western diet uh, which 
is mainly high intake of refined greens red meat saturated and unsaturated fatty acids all this can lead to an increase in the risk of atopic dermatitis but again uh, no clear cut evidence it's also said that breastfeeding and delayed weaning so uh, uh, various studies are conducted where it was found that children who are breastfed exclusively breastfed for 6 months and um, continued uh, breastfeeding for more than 1 and 1/2 18 to 24 months have a lesser um, incidence of atopic dermatitis obesity is again uh, is linked to a number of conditions in dermatology increased incidence of atopic eczema is also reported with obesity so these are all the um, environmental factors so like i said there are four important factors in the pathogenesis of ad one ad is short form for atopic dermatitis one is um, genetics we already discussed about that the second one was environmental factors the third one is immune dysregulation and the fourth one is skin barrier dysfunction so again immune dysregulation is a very complicated and huge thing there are a lot of pathways involved a lot of interleukins tumor necrosis factor alpha a lot of uh, t lymphocytes b lymphocytes involved so just remember that there is increased immunoglobulin e antibody response in uh, to the allergens in patients with atopic dermatitis and here the key difference is the differentiation of the t lymphocytes into th2 cells so there is from the main interleukins here which have to which are to be remembered as interleukin 4 5 and 13 so there is no need to remember the entire pathway what uh, importantly we need to remember is interleukin 4 5 and 13 because again this is going to be useful to us therapeutically when we use certain systemic drugs against these interleukin 4 5 and 13 which uh, can help us in the treatment of atopic dermatitis so these are the three interleukins which you have to remember 4 5 and 13 okay skin barrier dysfunction skin barrier dysfunction is um, the basic pathology so all these three conditions like all these three factors as pathogenesis in the pathogenesis there is genetics immune dysregulation and environmental factors they basically cause a skin barrier dysfunction so here all this is a very complicated slide so no need to remember all this what you have to remember is there is a certain protein in our uh, stratum conium which is known as filaggrin so there is a filaggrin mutation so again this comes in the genetic part and the skin dysfunction Uh, part as well so it's a, like i said it's a combination of all hypotheses there is no single um or is a single final common path or single hypothesis so just remember that filaggrin is a very critical protein which has to be present in the um in our stratum conium which is responsible for holding all these structures together and it's also responsible for the formation of other proteins like loricrin involucrin you have to remember all these just remember the protein filaggrin so in atopic dermatitis there is a mutation in this protein there is a filaggrin mutation so that basically leads to a disruption of the skin barrier there are some so these were the four main etiological factors in the pathogenesis there are some other additional things that is the is there any um connection to the cutaneous microbiome and the gut microbiome like i said again this can be a part of the environmental factors also but why i have i have put this separately is because they found that more than 90% of patients with atopic dermatitis have their skin colonized with staphylococcus aureus whereas in in patients non atopic patients only 5% of them were colonized with staphylococcus aureus so this reflects the disrupted <coughs> skin barrier function uh, so this causes a decrease in the antimicrobial property and altered cytokine milieu so we all know that the there are certain normal commensals which are uh, living on our skin that is uh, the most common commensal which is found on our skin is staphylococcus epidermidis so <clears throat> and staphylococcus aureus is also found to a certain extent that is about 5% in patients with atopic dermatitis <clears throat> this um, percentage is increased to 90% yeah so it was a uh, what i want to say from this slide is that they found that the children with uh, in children of atopic dermatitis a higher percentage of staphylococcus aureus was also found in the gut so this again later predisposed to atopic dermatitis so this has nothing to do with what food you consume it's again inbuilt as if depends on the immunity so 
in children who have more staphylococcus aureus and coliforms in their gut they were predisposed to develop atopic dermatitis later on in their lives well this is what i was talking about this is the atopic march uh, so like uh, so as you can see from this slide there are four um, basic uh, pathogenesis four basic uh, diseases here eczema is nothing but atopic dermatitis food allergy not a very major role asthma and rhinitis so uh, the atopic march uh, what is it what exactly is atopic march atopic march is the progression of atopic condition so a child who has uh, atopic eczema in very early life is predisposed to develop asthma in uh, around mid uh, childhood or adolescent age and that later progresses to allergic rhinitis in the adulthood so childhood eczema adolescent asthma and adult rhinitis so that is the atopic march food allergy can be there or it, uh, it might not be there not very relevant just remember atopic eczema uh, asthma and uh, rhinitis this is again a this is a summary of the pathogenesis so um, like i said the skin barrier defect the first pathogenesis skin barrier defect can be caused because of genetic factors because of environmental factors because of immune dysfunction so what that does is there is an increased transepidermal water loss so uh, what is transepidermal water loss transepidermal water loss is abbreviated as twl so normally uh, the skin barrier the the layers of our skin they don't allow for the water to evaporate and very less uh, like 10 5 to 10% of the water is lost so um what happens in atopic dermatitis is because of this uh, barrier dysfunction around 80 to 90% of the water is lost so that, that is there is an increased transepidermal water loss and that leads to dryness dryness is the basic cause for itching in any dermatological condition just just remember that so which is why we uh, usually give moisturizers no matter uh, what condition uh, irrespective of what condition uh, in the sense it it this holds true for majority of the conditions not all the conditions so pruritus is basically caused by dryness and uh, inflammation can also play a very minor role so this um, prurite uh, prurit sorry dryness and inflammation causes pruritus and that leads to scratch and that is a vicious like cycle the itch scratch cycle like i said again remember the basic pathology atopic dermatitis is an itch that rashes so basically the patient starts itching so much that there is later on appearance of a rash so initially there is no rash because of the itching there is development of rash and that again has a lot of complications the pruritus and scratching has a lot of complications i've just mentioned infection over here we'll read about the complications again so there are three basic uh, stages of atopic dermatitis or three basic uh, what do i say trimodal distribution of atopic dermatitis one is the infantile stage the second is the childhood stage and the third is the adolescent or the adult stage so infantile ad it says two years but may typically less than one year of age it develops after the second month of life and it initially develops as edematous papules on the cheeks so cheek is a very common area for atopic de uh, dermatitis to develop in children with sparing of the central face uh, i'll just show you some photos so th th these are the predisposing uh, areas for atopic dermatitis in a child so why it's important for us to know is the predisposing areas change according to the age so in children the predisposing areas are different in uh, in infants the predisposing areas are different and in adult life the predisposing areas are different so in a child the cheek neck chest elbows and knees these are the predisposing areas so this is atopic eczema very uh, very classic picture of atopic eczema when you see a rash like this very erythematous and edematous looking with fine scales Uh, present bilaterally over the cheeks it's usually atopic eczema and also there is sparing of the diaper area next uh, we move on to childhood uh, atopic dermatitis that is anything which presents after the age of 1 year up to the age of 12 years or 15 years it's called as childhood atopic dermatitis and 
here the legions are different they don't tend to be as erythematous as reddish looking as the ones which which we see in infantile atopic dermatitis and they often become lichenified so lichenification is a um, uh, what do i say it's uh, it any skin lesion can be turned uh, termed as lichenified if you see increased skin markings and you see hyperpigmentation and thickening of the skin so these are the three things which are there in a lichenified skin lesion increased skin marking uh, hyperpigmentation and skin thickening so here <clears throat> the classical sites of predisposition are the antecubital and the popliteal fossa that is flexural so if you can remember <clears throat> atopic dermatitis in the infantile stage was extensor so mainly remember this photo the elbows and the knees are involved so this is more of an extensor um predilection whereas childhood ad is flexural so this is one of the things uh, very confusing and what usually is asked in the multiple choice question childhood ad is flexural whereas infantile ad is extensor so <coughs> other common locations of childhood area are wrists hands ankles feet neck and eyelids so anything which it says 12 years but we usually consider 15 to 18 years any atopic dermatitis which presents about this age that is the child has no history of any atopic dermatitis no history of asthma no history of rhinitis and uh, you know throughout their Uh, childhood and suddenly they develop these rashes and you suspect atopic dermatitis that is when it is termed as adult onset atopic dermatitis here again you see um subacute to chronic lichenified lesions and involvement of the flexural folds senile ad is we don't term it as senile ad anymore it is characterized by marked xerosis and usually presents over the age of 60 years Yeah, so these are just a few images which are um, showing you the typical findings of atopic dermatitis. Here you can see over the this this is the flexor aspect of the hand. So this is a childhood uh, atopic dermatitis, and this is actually the neck. The second image which you can see here below to the right of the screen is actually the neck. So this is lichenification. What you can see here is increased skin markings, hyperpigmentation, and thickening of the skin. This is also known as atopic dirty neck. atopic dirty neck and this is lichenification this this the first top picture you can see is of the um, antecubital fossa so this is a flexural atopic dermatitis or childhood atopic dermatitis so there are a lot of variants of atopic dermatitis to explain the second picture here of of this child with some lesions around his lips um you need to know what are the variants of atopic dermatitis there are a lot of variants it, it uh, we have to suspect atopic dermatitis if there are certain conditions which are associated with it i'll be talking about it further just remember that it need not always be on the cheeks it need not always be flexural or on the extensor involvement when you see certain typical lesions you always suspect atopic dermatitis so this uh, child has something called as lip lickers eczema so that is constant licking of the lips so that is also a feature of atopic dermatitis this is lip lickers eczema Yeah, so this is what I was talking about: regional variants of atopic dermatitis. So um, there are several regional variants of atopic dermatitis. The face is a very uh, frequent uh, location. So this, what I was telling you, eczema of the lips. It is also known as chelitis sicca. So chelitis is anything which affects the lips, and sicca is dryness. So it's characterized by dryness of the vermilion border of the lip, lips, and uh, Associated with peeling and fissuring. So patients, what they do is they tend to moisten their lips by constantly licking. So this is one thing which all the patients do. What do you do when your lips are dry? You constantly lick them, trying to moisturize. So that that there is this is something which you should never do because that does not moisturize your lip. That only increases the dryness. So what we advise is apply a moisturizer, apply Vaseline jelly. Okay, so that is lip lickers eczema. other common facial features of childhood eczema are ear eczema so you you might have seen lot of kids having um, some lesions over where the ear piercing site is present usually that is a uh, allergic reaction to the nickel which is usually mixed with gold so that is ear eczema very common in atopic dermatitis 
eyelid eczema eyelid eczema is again a very common manifestation and it can sometimes represent the only manifestation of atopic dermatitis so in the face what you need to remember is lip plicus eczema um, ear eczema and eyelid eczema yeah other regional variants of atopic dermatitis are head and neck dermatitis um head and neck dermatitis usually occur in adults so it affects the face scalp and neck again uh, one important uh, regional dermatitis regional variant which occur in children is known as jpd that is juvenile plantar dermatosis so this occurs in the feet the plantar aspect of the soles and the thing to remember here is glazed erythema there is like a smooth uh, smooth appearance of the skin that is known as glazed erythema juvenile plantar dermatosis so okay let's just uh, quickly revise the variants with the face there are three important variants uh, lip plicus eczema ear eczema and eyelid eczema two two uh, important variants in the hands and the feet one is atopic hand eczema and juvenile plantar dermatitis the other one is head and neck dermatitis so four or five variants which you have to regional variants which you have to remember again all this um just remember there's no need to remember all this but if you see a patient if you see a child with numular eczema numular eczema is a type of eczema where you can see coin coin like or uh, oval oval looking lesion so that is known as numular eczema nipple eczema so all these again are very indicative that the child also has atopic dermatitis and you have to rule out it's just not simple numular eczema or nipple eczema like i said the main complaint of the child will be pruritus intense pruritus is the main complaint of the child at the itch is often worse in the evening and may be exacerbated by factors such as sweating or clothing so like i said i think i discussed about this uh, during the lecture on scabies all conditions in dermatology are more in the night so there was again a very recent randomized controlled trial which was conducted which said that out of the um, relieving factors for itch more than the antihistamines and the medications with the dermatologist prescribed concentration to work improved the uh, age of the patient better so this goes to show that uh, you know just keep busy the, you know the the saying devil's mind is the uh, what is that uh, idle mind is devil's workshop so this was actually proved by a trial which said that more than medications concentration to work improved the age of the uh, patient better that in a condition like scabies so Just remember any dermatological condition, it just worse at night. Um, so excoriations. What are excoriations? So when a patient itches, and the scratch marks which appear in that area are called as excoriation. So that is again very uh, widely prevalent in atopic dermatitis. With repeated rubbing and scratching, the skin becomes thickened and leathery with exaggerated skin masses. This is what I was telling you was lichenification. So. the basic lesions in atopic dermatitis are excoriations and lichenifications these are again uh, why i put all these images are these are not exactly directly atopic dermatitis but when you see a child with all these features you have to rule out always rule out atopic dermatitis so uh, this picture here of the showing the cheek of a child so this can you see the whitish um, patchy white patchy distribution of lesions so this is something known as pityriasis alba so i think most of you have a misconception about pityriasis alba that pityriasis alba has something to do with the parasitic or a helminthic infection and i have seen lot of even dermatology residents uh, giving albendazole in patients with pityriasis alba it's got nothing to do with any sort of helminth or parasitic infections most of the patients come saying that Uh, whenever they see a white patch on the face or anywhere else, pityriasis alba. Ki, uh, what do they say? Hula hula dausti, hula dausti. That is what they. And the sentence in Canada it means that they want the medicine for the worms. So, very common misconception that it's because of parasitic infection. There is also a very minimal role of that, but pityriasis alba is mainly a type of eczema. It's because of dryness of the skin. It is a uh indicator of atopic dermatitis so we do not treat pityriasis alba with uh, albendazole we treat pityriasis alba with uh, moisturizers okay so this is something which you need to remember so this criteria 
is known as Hanafin and Radka's criteria. The J is silent. It's called Hanafin and Radka criteria for atopic dermatitis. So it has major and minor criteria. The major criteria are uh, pruritus, uh, flexural dermatitis, a chronic nature of the condition, and a personal or family history of atopy. So these are the four major criteria out of which at least three have to be present. And these are all the minor criteria. There are a lot of minor criteria. You don't have to remember all of them. Uh, and I've talked about most of these things. All these, the regional dermatitis, the nipple eczema, chelitis, hand and foot dermatitis, all these, all these are again, uh, uh, let's talk about some of the terminologies here. What is Denny Morgan fold? So Denny Morgan fold is um, an infraorbital fold. Let me show you some images if I have. Yeah. So this child, uh, it's not very evident, but the infraorbital fold, which you can see here, that is referred to as the Denny Morgan fold. That is also an indicator of atopic dermatitis. Keratoconus, yeah. There are a lot of ocular complications of atopic dermatitis as well. Keratoconus, anterior and posterior subcapsular cataracts, a periorbital melanosis and darkening. Okay, pityriasis alba. So, like I said, all these regional variants, and you have to suspect atopic dermatitis when all these conditions are present. So this was the Hanifin and Radka's criteria. These are the minor criteria. No need to remember, but just know that there is some, uh, just know the name of the criteria which is used for atopic dermatitis. So this is, um, this the first picture shows Denny Morgan fold. And the second picture here this is something known as keratosis pilaris. So if you can see here, there's something called as keratosis pilaris. Um, have I not mentioned it? Okay, yeah, this perifollicular accentuation. So that is uh, what is known as peri, um, keratosis pilaris. So these are actually lesions in the perifollicular area. There is sort of a perifollicular accentuation. That is known as keratosis pilaris. Again, this is another criteria, UK working party criteria. There is no need to remember what is the exact criteria. Just remember that there are two named criteria for atopic dermatitis. One is the Hanifin and Radka. The second one is the UK working party criteria. Okay, so let's quickly um, move on to the atopic uh, dermatitis statement. This is the most important part because you have to know how to manage a child. I see a lot of kids being managed uh, in the wrong way, even by the pediatricians. A lot of uh, potent steroids being applied. So it's important for us to learn about the proper management of a kid with atopic dermatitis. So uh, um, the first thing which we uh, do is sort of counsel the patients counseling forms a very important part of any condition in dermatology so these are all the things which we should counsel uh, we counsel them about the bath we counsel them about how to uh, take care of their skin so what i uh, usually counsel patients is use a baby soap um, or you know um, it says here to avoid soaps or use any soap substitute but there is something known as a syndet so let's not get into too many details about that so syndet is a soap like um, substance, you get a lot of medicated uh, syndet bars available. So which has a pH, which is equivalent to the body's pH. So what all these other soaps do is like all this Lux, Miso Sandal, etc, etc. So they have a very acidic pH. So what they do is they strip the skin of your moisture. So usually advise kids to use a baby soap or a syndet with pH equivalent to that of the skin. And the second thing is, uh, you have to counsel the uh, patients how to give bath to their how to give a bath to the if the child is very young that is an infant or a child or a um, you know two to ten year age group child so we ask them to keep the water lukewarm not very hot water uh, not to have bath for more than five to ten minutes and uh, why wipe with a cotton towel do not rub pat gently pat dry with a cotton towel and always wear cotton clothes so these are all the advice which we give. The second one is reduce the exposure to allergens. But again, this is not very practical, uh, not very practical advice because you can't keep your house uh, dust free all the time. So there are a lot of house mites and not very practical, but just advise them to keep an overall uh, clean environment. 
yeah this sentence is very important special diets will not help most individuals uh however if food allergies do e- exist if you suspect food allergies you ask the patient to avoid eggs shellfish other sort of uh, nuts so this is the most important um, slide when it comes to the treatment management emollients emollients are moisturizers which soften the skin and reduce the itching so how we advise the child is uh, have after having bath and you gently pat the skin of the child apply the emollient when the skin is still wet and continue uh, reapply again at night or twice during the day depending on the severity of the condition corticosteroids yeah so topical corticosteroids are useful to a certain extent um if the skin is very erythematous inflamed dry or lichenified we do uh, i do advise topical corticosteroid very mild ones hydrocortisone or desunai um so yeah these are again all the principles of use of corticosteroids i'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that just remember the topical corticosteroids mild to moderate potency have a role in atopic dermatitis especially if it is very severe antibiotics do we use antibiotics in atopic dermatitis only if there is a secondary infection like you can see in this picture um like i said atopic in children with atopic dermatitis 90% of them are colonized with staphylococcus aureus so you give oral antibiotics if there's a secondary anti uh, bacterial infection yeah again uh, wet wrap therapy is something which um, is extensively practiced in government hospitals or places uh, you know where uh, you can't um, there are no very expen- where expensive dressings cannot be used so what we do in wet wrap therapy is this is uh, specially practiced in uh, children uh, who have uh, very acute severe vp lesions so there is first the fir- first layer is a topical corticosteroid cream and then we apply a layer of wet gauze and then over that we apply a layer of uh, dry gauze and we uh, roll it with a roller bandage and they are left in place for um a day or two okay so this is known as wet wrap therapy so they might ask you what is wet wrap therapy just remember the layers a layer of topical corticosteroid wet gauze dry gauze and roller bandage topical calcineurin inhibitors are uh, off late they are even uh, replacing topical corticosteroids especially tacrolimus and pimecrolimus they don't have any of the side effects of steroids and can be very safely used in atopic dermatitis crisabrol this um, why for this slide is it's a very recent update it was very recently fda approved for the treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis in children above 2 years of age so crisabrol is a pde4 inhibitor phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor so they might also ask you what is the other phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor used in dermatology it's apremilast that is an oral uh, pde4 inhibitor crisabrol is a topical pde4 inhibitor you must remember the name crisabrol again dupilumab this is why uh, i said it's important to remember the interleukins 4 5 and 13 so dupilumab was recently fda approved for the treatment of adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis so the dose it's important to remember the dose and the mechanism of action so the mechanism of action is it targets the interleukin 4 and 13 and the dose is 600 uh, mg uh, initially subcutaneous and every and 300 mg every week we usually give it for around 6 months so it was also recently approved for children about 2 years of age and there are there is a very big randomized control trial be conducted right now for its use in children below 2 years of age so remember dupilumab the mechanism of action interleukin 4 and 13 and the dose 600 mg stat followed by 300 mg every week again all these uh, these were the topical uh, dupilumab sorry is an oral drug so now i'm going to be talking about what are the systemic drugs which can be used cyclosporin uh, again it is used in very severe cases for the dose is 3 to 6 mg per kg azathioprine so remember the names you don't have to remember why the mechanism of action and all again is a separate class on drugs uh, methotrexate mycophenolate morphetal as a thioprene cyclosporine all these drugs are used in atopic dermatitis yeah i just i just want to talk very briefly about this slide systemic corticosteroids so we usually don't advise 
oral steroids unless it is a very severe acute flare of atopic dermatitis because invariably once you stop the systemic corticosteroid there is bound to be a flare and um, systemic corticosteroids are generally not advised in children because of their uh, numerous side effects on growth on skeletal uh, like skeletal growth sexual maturity they have unacceptable side effects which is why it's not advised unless the it's a life threatening condition and you don't have any other option that is when we give a short course of systemic corticosteroid again i already uh, spoke about this systemic antibiotics only when you suspect a secondary bacterial infection yeah antihistamines the supportive treatment is again very um, useful so we usually don't give non sedating antihistamines uh, sedative antihistamines like hydroxyzin or uh, chlorpheniramine maleate are the one which uh, are preferred because usually all patients with atopic dermatitis have sleep disturbance so use of sedative antihistamine is advised in atopic dermatitis you yeah, just remember the name omalizumab there are two i already told you about one uh, this might be like a question what the biologics which are used in atopic dermatitis one was dupilumab the other one is omalizumab <laughs> however omalizumab is not fda approved for atopic dermatitis the only fda approved indication of omalizumab is chronic idiopathic urticaria but because there is a role of ige in atopic dermatitis it also has been tried in atopic dermatitis systemic immunotherapy again um not not a very common therapy but just remember the name systemic immunotherapy is when you find out that this specific allergen is causing atopic dermatitis or triggering atopic dermatitis and you give small doses of that particular allergen to the child so that there is desensitization again not very commonly followed dietary supplements like i said um there is no need to restrict any particular group of diet uh, but you can give some additional supplements to the child vitamin d supplementation uh, fish oils uh, or evening primrose oil so these are all the supplementation which you can advise like i said food allergies so remember that food allergies do not cause atopic dermatitis atopic dermatitis can cause food allergy so it's the other way around prevention can you prevent can you really prevent atopic dermatitis not really um, certain kids are just predisposed uh, to atopic dermatitis especially those with a family history of atopy those who are not exclusively uh, breastfed you know those who are uh, given uh, formula milk in their early lives so these are all the kids who are predisposed to atopic dermatitis yeah, and again this is a very recent update so there are something known as probiotics or prebiotics like i said remember the slide where i told you about the cutaneous microbiome and the gut microbiome so i told you that in kids who had more of staphylococcus aureus in their microbiome and less of lactobacillus and bifidobacillus they were predisposed to atopic dermatitis so giving probiotics which contain lactobacilli some trials have shown that this can uh, reduce the incidence of atopic dermatitis yeah and this again the second line here is very important emollient therapy as prevention so a lot of studies now have shown that in in babies who are predisposed to atopic dermatitis like for example uh, both the parents have atopic dermatitis and their baby will invariably have atopic dermatitis or the mother has asthma the father has rhinitis the baby will invariably have atopic dermatitis so in such case in such babies you prophylactically uh, apply an emollient so that uh, it it is shown that prophylactic emollient therapy can act as a preventive method for atopic dermatitis